quite treacherous back here. <laughs> you want to take a look at it? A little bit of an obstacle course. Uh, thanks. It's an honor to be here. I was first at the Humanities Center seven years ago to take a week-long seminar with Helen Bendler on the poetry of Yeats, and I am still in my teaching and in my writing and in my living uh, benefiting from uh, the greater understanding of one of my favorite poets that I got that week. Um, and being here and asked to speak about the future of literary study, but attended by so many friends and colleagues from the past, I'm tempted uh, like Yeats to lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. And I'll do that if you'll indulge me for 30 seconds while I say that uh, David Porter and Ross Foreman, who are standing at the back, were my classmates at Stanford in the PhD program in comparative literature, which started 20 years ago this fall. I'm not sure that they're happy for me to mention the exact number of years. Aaron Carlson I also saw here, which is a pleasure. And then the, as I look around the room, Kathy Gallagher uh, graciously hosted and supervised my postdoctoral research at Berkeley in the later 90s. And Dick Broadhead uh, was dean of Yale College when I first arrived there as an assistant professor in 1998. Uh, and so it's tempting to think back. It's hard to think into the future, and I'm not going to present a manifesto, uh, but what I'll present instead are three projects that I've been involved with that I think may give us, uh, that, that at any rate have something to do with my hopes for what I will do in literary study in the next decade, uh, but that really go back to what I've been doing for, for the last several years. Uh, and these three, the three categories in which these are organized are first having to do with research, uh, next with teaching and curriculum design, and third with sort of the structure of the enterprise of literary study and the humanities uh, more broadly. But I think what unifies them is the question that's come up several times already of audience uh, and, and to whom do we address ourselves as literary scholars. Uh, so starting with research, I've just uh, published a book uh, that I've been working on for a decade uh, called Religious Experience in the Modernist Novel. I can pinpoint when I decided that this was the book I was going to write rather than the book on Henry James that I'd intended to write to a conversation that I had with Dick Broadhead in the fall of 2000 when he uh, graciously granted me a fellowship to um, study uh, for, for a year, 2001-2002. Now when 2001-2002 came along, I realized that many of my colleagues who, like me, were starting on their second books had taken up topics like violence, terror, uh, state power, homo sacer, uh, uh, the conflict between East and West, or more specifically Christianity and Islam, because we'd all just lived through September 11th, uh, 2001. Uh, but looking back, I now realize that even though my book says nothing about any of those topics, uh, except maybe a little tiny bit about Christianity and, and Islam, it's, uh, it, it too is shaped by the decade that we've just lived through. Uh, and particularly by the rethinking of the secularization narrative, which was a dominant narrative uh, that we've had around, at least since Matthew Arnold, possibly since the first chapter of Genesis, uh, telling us that these days are secular and the old days were religious. In my own subfield of modernism, the version of this story that we hear is that the Victorian period was the era of, of faith and its crisis, uh, serious people like Leslie Stephen, uh, and that uh, the moderns, on the other hand, were dancing on the grave of God and joyfully embracing irony uh, and happily living in a secular world. Uh, and what I discovered in my research, uh, what I was already thinking before September 11th, but was probably shaped by September 11th, was the inadequacy of this narrative of secularization for understanding the role of art in the 20th century. Uh, and specifically, in my case, uh, these novelists who probably would have seen themselves as secular and whom we tend to see as secular, uh, Joyce, Kafka, Proust, Wolf, Henry James, uh, the extent to which they uh, too were questioning secular modernity and looking for spiritual and religious types of experience that perhaps their parents had, uh, had experienced in a more direct way. Joyce is an unusual case because he went through the process of secularization and then the search for an alternative to it all in one lifetime. Uh, but uh, so I think what does, what's the message for uh, literary study? It's that the narratives of secularization that we tend to have inherited from history and particularly from sociology and the social sciences are familiar ones within which we've tended to operate, but that we have something to contribute to the rethinking of those narratives. Uh, and in terms of my hope for what literary study can do, it uh, 
ties closely to what Toro was saying about the hermeneutics of suspicion. It's that in this turn to religion as a subject matter for investigation, we, don't, we avoid the tendency to read religion simply as a projection of uh, uh, other forces, whether those are political, economic, social, and so on, uh, state actors, and so on, but uh, as also originating an experience and as being part of culture, uh, uh, an autonomous part of culture that needs to be understood to some extent on its own terms. This is not to say that I, that I think we should abandon secular criticism or anything like that, but that our uh, humanities disciplines have not always been good at dealing with the religious because we tend to want to understand it as some form of something else. We need to get beyond that. Um, and this relates in, ter in terms of the question of audience to our interaction with other cognate disciplines like history, and this is something that um, at Berkeley they were doing already in the 90s and before that in the 80s and, and so on uh, with history and with the social sciences and I think it could be applied too to the arts and, and, um, and the sciences. Uh, the next point is about teaching in the curriculum and I was uh, fortunate to be asked to edit uh, the 20th century volume of the Norton Anthology of World Literature. Uh, this is a work that actually goes back uh, more than 50 years to a volume called World Masterpieces edited by Maynard Mack Rene Vallec and other colleagues of that uh, generation. Uh, and you can see in the, the change in title since World Masterpieces, a change in attitude. Uh, we no longer purport to be offering masterpieces. Uh, but furthermore, the, the structure of the anthology is quite different from what it was 50 years ago. Uh, in just the, there are now six volumes of it, for one thing, instead of one. Uh, but in just the sixth volume, the one that I'm, that I'm uh, editing, we have uh, 70 contributions from 20 different languages uh, representing all the continents of the world except Antarctica. Uh, and uh, uh, and genre, all kinds of genres and literature from across the 20th century and up into the 21st. So what have I learned from doing this? Uh, uh, in a narrow way, I guess I could say that uh, I've tried in establishing the contents of this new volume to break down the assumption that formal experimentation was something that happened in Europe during modernism in the early half of the 20th century and that the second half of the 20th century consisted of a lot of very referential works, referential works, uh, realistically depicting the plight of uh, the post-colonial world. And I've instead tried to show the complexity of both experimental and more traditional forms of, of narrative and, and indeed of verse and drama in all parts of the world. Uh, more broadly, I think that, this, that the experience of editing it, editing it shows me something about the future of comparative literature, which contrary to uh, reports is not dead. Uh, uh, and that is that the task of comparative literature has changed. Uh, when Bellick founded comparative literature at Yale or when Ross and David and I started studying comparative literature at Stanford, most of us studied Western European literatures. It was assumed that we knew French. Many of us also learned German or Italian, some Russian, Spanish. Uh, brave ones like Dave would study Chinese and Ross Japanese and Portuguese. Uh, but still, there was a limited number of world languages that were understood to be the ones that are studied in comparative literature. Today, I'm the director of the graduate studies uh, program in comparative literature at Yale, and students come and present 20 different languages that just in the last decade uh, that they are studying. This is not just a matter of a shift from French and German and Italian to Spanish and Arabic and Chinese, although of course that's a big part of the shift, uh, but it's also the fact that with heritage learners, with international experiences of the kind that have been talked about a number of times so far, uh, we, uh, students have a different range of linguistic uh, abilities coming into a comparative literature program, and this is true also of undergraduates, uh, and, uh, and therefore that we need to rethink how we educate them. It's not going to be enough for us to say, okay, well now we'll get an Arabic specialist and now a Chinese specialist or comparatist who does Chinese and Arabic or something like that, uh, but instead we need to reach out to various studies programs, to history departments, to anthropology, to places where there are people with these linguistic skills inside our institutions or at, at sister institutions, and uh, train our students a model that my colleague Hans Saucy talks about as the model of fieldwork in anthropology. What we offer is training in the theory and, and, and practice of literature in general and, and of comparison. Uh, and, what, uh, and, and then those students who come with specialist knowledge that we may not ourselves possess can learn something from us about technique, theory, method, uh, and something from the area study specialist about the specific uh, area of knowledge that they're interested in, but this will still be comparative literature, and it's quite different from the comparative literature of European literary history or European literary theory. 
On the level of the student body and what this means for the future of literary teaching, I'd say our student bodies are ever more diverse. Uh, and the exploration of the canon that's been talked about a couple of times has been a wonderful thing, but has mainly been restricted to English language works. Uh, you get heritage learners who know, for example, Vietnamese, Korean, South Asian languages, to some extent African languages, East European languages, and people from Latin America, obviously. And uh, our courses need to speak to their needs and interests. And there's a lot of great literature from all over the world uh, that, that can be read. It's true that most of us will wind up teaching this only in translation and that we rely on second hand on the efforts of the experts who know something about the original language. But that's not, I think, a reason not to teach these materials. OK, and the third point is to the structure of the inquiry uh, and has to do with the digital humanities. Um, about five years ago, I started a project which is now ca called the Modernism Lab. It started as uh, what, what they call a Web 1.0 project, which was that I uh, took some materials that were available at Yale and I asked people there to digitize them and put them up on the web for my students and other scholars to have access to. So for example, uh, the manuscript of Conrad's Heart of Darkness was digitized and now if anybody is interested in looking at the manuscript of Heart of Darkness, you can look at it in pretty high resolution. Uh, it's not so easy to see the backs of pages, but it's even possible to do that uh, on, online from anywhere in the world. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the manuscript of Joyce's The Dead and uh, art from the Yale Art Gallery and from, uh, from the Yale Center for British Art. Uh, but while I enjoyed this model and the students got something out of studying these works online, I've moved more recently to what is called a Web 2.0 model and goes back to the question about Facebook. Uh, so that I, what I've tried to do is keep the, you know, those responses that people write and interesting conversations that they have on that class software that we all use in different ways, to try and, and structure that and keep it from semester to semester in certain ways so that uh, what, what we have now is a complex relational database of 4,000 entries having to do with um, the lives, mainly entries from journals and letters, the lives of 24 modern British writers in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, socially tagged, so that a student who reads about Wolf uh, having a conversation with T.S. Eliot about D.H. Lawrence and psychoanalysis will tag all this with Wolf, Eliot, Lawrence, uh, psychoanalysis, and somebody later on coming to do research on psychoanalysis will find that uh, in, in our database. Uh, I know it's a database, and that's a little, even the word makes me a little anxious, but, uh, and in addition, there's a wiki of 300 interpretive essays, so it's not a merely empirical thing. Uh, 300 empirical, uh, interpretive essays written by uh, faculty, students, and both graduate students and undergraduates. Uh, the relevant fact here, I think, is that our experience of what scholarship is in terms of peer review, in terms of submitting a paper for the senior professor to grade or to comment on or not, uh, or submitting an article to a print journal or even an electronic journal, this is, is being transformed. And we certainly need to think about what the standards for scholarship are, how we're going to evaluate collaborative projects. It's not accidental that I only started this after I got tenure. Uh, but uh, I think that there are all kinds of possibilities for breaking down traditional hierarchies between faculty and grad students, between grad students and undergrads, between the academy and the non-academic, between writers and readers, uh, inherent in these technologies. And while it's understandable that we're scared of the tendency, their tendency to erode slow reading and to make us move fast around. Uh, there's, there are also possibilities that we should be embracing and, and looking at seriously as part of the future, not only of literary study, but of the humanities more generally. Thank you.